Hello. Have you ever visited your doctor and felt like you had questions that didn't get answered? You're not alone, according to researchers from the University of Pittsburgh. They're here to explain self-advocacy and knowing what to do when someone is having a heart attack or cardiac arrest. We have medical experts here for American Heart Month. Plus, the Passion of Mary Cartwell Dawson is being performed by the Pittsburgh Opera for the first time. We'll talk to them about what it means to have this production in the city Dawson called home. So pull up a chair and meet us at the corner. Intersection starts right now. Hello, I'm Lisa Smith, Director of Community Impact at KDKA Plus and the host of Intersections. It's hard enough to find out you have a life-threatening illness, but for many patients, that life-changing event is compounded by how they're treated by some healthcare professionals. Questions may go unanswered or you may not agree with the course of treatment. That's when an advocate is needed and that advocate may have to be you. Joining us to talk about self-advocacy are Professor Teresa Hagen Thomas, a researcher with the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, and Yvette Dudley Morrissey, research coordinator at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome, ladies, to Intersections. Welcome. Thank you for having Thank us on. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, this is such an interesting topic, right? Because everybody has to go to the doctor, and in some unfortunate cases, it's it's a serious situation. So tell us a little bit about why or how the self-advocacy idea kind of came about in terms of your research. Yeah, so we're really interested in what happens when you have a really serious illness being diagnosed. And oftentimes people can, in their normal life, be fully present, engaged, ask questions, sort of build up a relationship. Well, what happens when you're so sick that you just can't do that, it's not easy. And plus in a healthcare setting, there's usually a power dynamic between the patient and the provider, which makes it all the more daunting to say, yeah. hey, you know, um, I need something else or you're not really understanding who I am or what I need. So we look at it in the context of cancer care and a lot of that was derived from my own family's experiences having issues, which is why I went into nursing school and then went into research to really figure out ways that we as healthcare providers and as communities can better support people when they're diagnosed and throughout their treatment and into survivorship to really say, hey, you know, this is who I am, these are my priorities and my values, and um, give them the skills to make those needs known to their healthcare providers and their social network. Yeah. So how exactly does this research work? It's a study and you're signing people up, like what happens when they're part of the study? Yeah, so a lot of our work, we spent 10 years first listening to patients and doing a lot of interview studies and qualitative research, which sort of like an interview, you get to know their stories. And we did that for a lot of different women, a lot of different men. Uh, from what they told us, we figured out what do they really need? What are the skills that they're saying they don't have and they need in order to improve their quality of life or their navigation of the healthcare system? Um, so based on all of that research, we developed the current program. And it's really something intended for right, when a woman is diagnosed to say, here's how to be a patient uh, with an advanced cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And right now we're keeping it very simple and we're trying to make something that's very accessible, not something that requires a lot of travel or in-person visits, what a lot of people don't have energy for or the ability to be traveling. So we have um, something that's technology based on a tablet okay. where we give it to them and they basically see diff stories of different women um, and they get to choose how those women behave in different challenging situations, situations that we know they're likely to face and then they get to see what are the positive things that happen when you speak up for yourself and what are maybe some of the less uh, successful things when you don't speak up for yourself. And in that way, they're learning um, and exposed to self-advocacy skills, which we hope they'll then take in their real life and, and improve their care. Yeah, so that you're actually talking to um, the subjects of the study. Yes. What are some of these stories that you're hearing? What are they telling you that you hear maybe over and over and over again in mm -hmm. terms of um, their experience? 
Well, that's a really good question because, you know, every participant is unique and um, being an African-American woman and being in the healthcare industry for a long time, you see that there are often times there's disparity in just things that some patients just would not necessarily maybe even talk to their healthcare provider about. So they, they tend to be more open and free willing to let you know what's going on in their personal life. So I'm not there to be a therapist or a, you know, a social worker or anything of that sort, but I'm there to help them to realize that as they go through this um, process, this cancer prognosis, diagnosis, and process that there are ways to help them speak up for their wants, needs, and desires. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like what's being said, then of course, you know, there are other ways to, you know, let the physicians, your healthcare providers know what your interests are. And sometimes even patients have said to me, um, you know, that they're so overwhelmed um, and, you know, they're moving and they're sick and there's all these different things. So we just try to provide resources. And of course, Teresa is the primary investigator for the study, but I hear all the inside stories mm -hmm that then I go back and share with her. Some people do accept being in the study and others don't because they're like, oh, no, I don't have the time. But yeah. it's not that kind of study. It doesn't require a lot of time in their, in their um, part. Yeah, so we only have a little bit more time left, but I wanna make sure that we talk about just a couple of the, the skills that you think are really important. Um, asking questions, um, finding trustworthy information, having a social network, and then also being able to accept help. Tell us very quickly about the importance of that social network. Absolutely. So, I mean, so much is about the patient-provider relationship, and we talked about that, but almost, you know, 95% of a patient's life is spent not thinking about their health care or in a healthcare setting, and that's when having family, friends who are there to be providing you care, looking up information, supporting you with all your side effects is so important. Mm -hmm. Our study is focused on women, and for women, we're used to being providers, we're used to giving to other people. And now when you have a serious illness like cancer, you have to be willing to accept help. Yeah. So first we're trying to get people to understand who are all the people that are in my network that I can be supporting um, and support other people with cancer, mm -hmm. but also being willing to say, do you know what, I also need a turn right now yeah. and I need other people to come and step in and help me out for once. Well, ladies, thank you so much for being with us and sharing what you're doing. We really appreciate it. And um, we're gonna share some of the information on how people can contact you on our website. Thanks again. Thank, thank you, Thank you, thanks for having us. Well, coming up, it's Heart Month, but you need to know to stay heart healthy. You're watching Intersections. It's the organ that keeps you going, your heart. And it's just as important for women to know their risk of heart attack and heart disease as it is for men. And knowing CPR is important no matter your age. So joining us now to keep us heart aware are Dr. Sylvia Owusu Anza. She is the Medical Director of Emergency Medical Services at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And Dr. Raquel Tripp, an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome, ladies, doctors. To Thank you for having you. us. We got doctors in the house, yay. Yay. <laughs> so, you know, hard, it's so, so serious, right? Um, especially when it comes to the black community. You ladies have, um, you're working on a new program called a coma united tell me about what that is and what you do so a coma united is a nonprofit that dr Tripp and i put together uh, in order to serve our underserved communities and life-saving skills particularly cpr and stop the bleed we recognize as the american heart association says black and brown people are less likely to get cpr and less likely to survive from cardiac arrest which can happen to anyone and so we recognize that that is a very important um, goal to change those outcomes and so we put this together. A coma literally means heart in the Akan language from the Ashanti tribe of Ghana, West Africa. Wow, and there's also a, a, a part of this that deals with young people, is that right? Yeah, so we recognize that cardiac arrest can happen to anyone. So cardiac arrest truly means that your heart has just stopped and so a baby can have go into cardiac arrest or a hundred year old 
person can go into cardiac arrest. And we recognize that student athletes are at the highest risk of going into cardiac arrest. So we have in or helped uh, to train over 380 Division I student athletes at Pitt uh, CPR, and we've able to have one save. Wow. And we've also been able to train middle school students over the past three years at Arsenal Middle School uh, CPR as well. Yeah. So we're looking at some video right now of actually Mayor Ganey learning CPR. Dr. Shipp, talk about why it's so important for everybody really to understand, you know, CPR. Sure, um, I would say at least when we're looking at all the disparities, especially with health and recognizing that about 350,000 cardiac arrests happen per year. And when we look at the disparities, especially with communities of color, that when we're looking at outside of the home, that the disparities about 41% of people of color do not receive CPR compared to in the home where only about 26% of people receive that. And so recognizing that there's a need for us to act from the public. And one of the things that we address when we're doing our training, especially for um, you know, women are another a group of people where people are afraid because they don't want to touch the breasts or they're afraid that they're gonna violate. But recognizing that every woman is gonna say, please save my life. I don't care if you may touch a t something like that, but it's okay. It's all right. And also for older people, people are afraid for they think they're going to break a rib. But again, we always teach them, I can fix a rib. I can't fix the heart. And so that's why it's important for everyone to recognize that when we are doing CPR and that really, you know, stands for cardiac pulmonary resuscitation, we're bringing the heart and the lungs back to life. Yeah. Now we're, Dr. Sylvia, we're looking at the video that kind of shows that demonstration. Can you give me kind of like the points of what needs to happen when you're performing CPR? So we call it the three C's. You first want to check for safety. So you want to make sure you're in a safe place because if you're not safe, then you can't help the person who is unconscious or heart has stopped and is having trouble breathing. Once you realize the scene is safe or you've checked for safety, then you want to check on the person to see if they're actually unconscious. And uh, you can do that by, we call look, listen, feel. Um, look at the chest, feel the chest, and try to make sure they're breathing. We no longer check the pulse. We just see if they're breathing or not. If they're not breathing, then you want to call 911. If you're by yourself, put 911 on speakerphone. They will assist you and then start chest compressions is the, is the final C. Yeah. What is the difference between heart attack and cardiac arrest? Sometimes, you know, it seems like you kind of hear it and it's really not interchangeable. It is not interchangeable at all. So cardiac arrest mean, truly means that the heart has stopped. And there are many reasons that that could happen. Mm -hmm. There could be trouble with the electricity of the heart. There could be actual like blunt trauma, meaning a force such as a baseball or, or, or a hockey puck that goes to the heart and stops the heart. Um, whereas cardiac arrest is when there is blockage in the vessels that go to the heart. So there are vessels particularly that go to the heart that feed the heart, that give the heart oxygen and nutrients to survive. When you get blockage in those areas, that can cause a heart attack, which can maybe cause excruciating pain. It may cause different various symptoms, but you may not die from that. Mm -hmm. A heart attack can lead to your heart stopping, meaning cardiac arrest, but not all heart attacks are cardiac arrest. Yeah. So it usually happens in older people. You don't know of any five-year-olds or seven-year-olds who have heart attacks. So it's usually a process that happens over time. Yeah. And then so real quickly, because we're almost out of time, yeah. uh, Dr. Tripp, a little bit about being heart healthy, like there are things hopefully that we can do to maybe kind of ward off um, some of these heart diseases. Sure, and I would say being heart healthy, trying to eat um, foods that have more health consciousness. So eating your vegetables. I know that your, your, your mother, your father used to tell you, always eat your vegetables. Those are things that help things that are going to be less in fat. So not going to McDonald's all the time or Burger King, you know, trying to have home cooked meals where you know what you're putting into your body and then also exercising. So it's been recommended at least 45 minutes, you know, per day or at least three times a week. That's going to help where you don't build up that um, atherotic plaques. And so when you're talking about atherosis, that's one of the things that really is a factor when we're talking about heart attacks. So that's when this fat builds into the arteries and blocks them and clots them. And that's when a heart attack happens. So when you are heart healthy, that's when actually you don't have that blockage anymore. So those are big things that would be helpful. All right. Well, ladies, thank you so much for coming, sharing this really vital information with us and uh, good luck with your program. We appreciate it. Well, thank you for thank having you us. Thank you so much. All yes. Right. I right. appreciate it. <laughs> All right, well, coming up, the woman who started the National Negro Opera Company in Pittsburgh now has an opera about her being performed in Pittsburgh. Intersections, we'll be right back.
Mary Cardwell Dawson was a woman we should all know. She spent her life working to make sure talented, classically trained black singers and musicians could perform for audiences around the country, even though racism prevented them from performing in many venues, including here in Pittsburgh. Now we get to see a story about her called The Passion of Mary Cardwell Dawson, performed by the Pittsburgh Opera. Joining us to talk about the Pittsburgh premiere are Christopher Hahn. He is the general director of the Pittsburgh Opera. Rebecca Diaz, she is the director of Idea Initiatives and Community Engagement uh, with the Pittsburgh Opera. And Janae Solomon, the executive director of the National Opera House. Welcome everyone to Intersections. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Good you to be so here. much. So um, tell us, Christopher, a little bit about, you know, how this this opera came to be, you know, just itself ab about Mary Cardwell Dawson. Right. Um, I mean, put, putting together operas is actually quite a complicated uh, a process. Uh, there's a very dynamic a friend of mine who uh, runs the Glimmerglass Opera and also uh, the, uh, DC, um, Francesca Zambello. And uh, she uh, happened upon this idea about trying to pull together uh, a piece uh, uh, around Mary Cardwell Dawson because her story is so little known and so little told. Mm -hmm. um, and so she talked to me and, and I said, sounds like a great idea. And we were all sort of learning parts of the story as we were going along. Uh, Pittsburgh Opera did The Summer King, uh, an opera about Josh Gibson in 2017. And the whole cast of the, uh, that opera and Denise Graves was in that, in, in that piece, wanted to go and see the house. So we arranged a field trip, they sealed the house. Denise didn't see it, but they all came back and raved and raved about the story. So um, uh, she, I think, was talking to Francesca and th this, this plan was hatched to produce this piece. And I want to say straight off, it's not actually an opera opera, mm -hmm. it's a theatre piece with music. Mm -hmm. So um, there's snatches of opera, it's all about an opera performance, and, and chunks of Carmen, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But, um, so Francesca, who runs, uh, ran then the Glimmerglass Opera Festival in upstate New York, put this piece on, along came COVID. Mm -hmm. I went to see the world premiere of it, which was outside on the lawn. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then it got, got developed um, uh, more, uh, some changes, and then did it again a couple of years later. And so that's the production we'll be bringing to Pittsburgh yeah. uh, in April. Yeah. Tell me about the importance of having, Rebecca, tell me about the importance of having this production here. Well, it's so important because, uh, for several reasons. Yeah. First of all, we really need to see more diversity on stages. I think that's something we all can agree with here, that for just historical reasons, there hasn't always been as much diversity on stages. Mm -hmm. So it's really great to have this opera that not only is utilizing a cast that's very diverse, but telling a really diverse story that is also historically accurate. And we need more of those stories told from our history in different ways so that we don't forget that it happened in the first place mm -hmm. and we can kind of continue that lineage moving forward. Yeah. Janae, for you, like you've been so involved in this story and bringing this story to life, to see it coming here to Pittsburgh, what do you think of that? I think it's history being made. It's Mary Cardwell Dawson's story on stage, a story that we've been trying to tell for a long time. So this is a huge, significant moment. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about the actual story that will be on stage. It's about, you know, um, her trying to have a performance, but being, you know, barred by segregation and a storm. <laughs> yeah, so. a, a heady combination. Yeah. So, um, so th this takes place in D.C. because the the company was formed in Pittsburgh, was here for a, a quite a long time, uh, and and then she started to tour and she just sort of moved her operations to D.C. and she she largely performed on the banks of the Potomac. Um, because it was outdoors and she wasn't then facing all the restrictions you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but because along came the thunderstorms and we all know what th uh, the summer in DC feels like. Um, and so this piece is her teaching um, or rehearsing uh, three young singers who are in a production of Carmen that she's hoping to put on, but there's an impending thunderstorm. It's already washed out a couple of performances and she's lost ticket sales, which is crucially important mm -hmm. for her. So she's actually on the phone trying to get into various venues mm -hmm. and uh, various venues would then say, well, okay, fine, except um, you know, the colored audience needs to sit upstairs and she'd you know, yell and slam the phone down and say, I'm never ever performing for a segregated uh, audience. Mm -hmm. And these young singers are saying, 
okay, we understand that, that's, a, that's the moral high ground, but we want to perform because mm -hmm. they're, they're singers and actors. Sure. And so it's, it's, it's that tussle between her determined principle um, stance, mm -hmm. the desire to perform, and quite frankly, the, um, the pressing nature of trying to put on a production. Yeah. Um, you know, it's bad enough to put on an opera in a theater. It's even worse if it's outside <laughs> in the thunderstorm. And it's definitely wor worse, wor uh, worse when you're fighting the venue because of rules and regulations. Yeah. Did this uh, story actually happen, or is this kind of like a collaborate, you know, a combination it, of some a, of the It's things. a fictional sure. story about her struggles, and it really brings out how determined she was, mm -hmm. uh, what a strong <coughs> woman she was, yeah. and how she wasn't going to be deterred by anything, including the weather. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a very powerful piece. So it, 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 there's a lot of speech, so it's like a play with music. Mm -hmm. um, and there are chunks of Carmen, but then uh, we, we had separately composed three different songs that Mary sings about her aspirations, her challenges, yeah. uh, all the risks around what she does. Yeah, we're, we're almost out of time, but I just want to ask, um, you know, how significant is it that this is the place where she was trying to do this, right? Mm -hmm. And now this story is going to be on stage here in Pittsburgh. How significant? Janae, you know, what your thoughts on how significant this is? Again, I think it's history being made. It's very significant. It shows that we took her out of erasure. We took her from a hidden figure to a known figure, and we put her on stage in a different light. Mm, interesting. Well, it sounds wonderful. Um, I believe that it is going to be April 27th and 30th, as well as May 3rd and 5th. Thank you all so much. We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you so all much. Right. <laughs> And I'll have my final word when we come back. Advocacy. Everyone needs someone to speak up for them, whether it's a family member, a friend, or someone who shares the same opinions as you, even someone fighting the same fights as you. And sometimes you have to be your own advocate, like we heard today from the Pitt researchers, helping women find their voices at their most vulnerable and trying time. Or Mary Cartwell Dawson, advocating for the right to sing to audiences not dictated by race. Many of the rights we have today began with advocacy. Imagine how today's advocates can shape our future. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Intersections.